Hello Internet! It's time to finish our repair of the Pentax Electro Spotmatic. The next thing we need to do is to install our new log compression network with the new diode chain and a differently valued resistor in place of this original Sina diode and this 100 ohm resistor. So let's first get these components off so we can measure how much space we have Let's see how much space we have in this slot. It's about 2.8 millimeters. And lengthwise we have about not quite 9 millimeters because the Sina diode for the switch transistor is protruding also into this slot. Let's check the length of one of the diodes. And it's a little bit more than 2.8 millimeters. It's close to 3 millimeters, including the leads. So the diodes are a little bit too large to place them at right angles to the slot. Maybe we could place them diagonally. I'm thinking that a diagonal arrangement of the diodes like this would be the neatest solution. It's somewhat pushing the length we have available. I think it should be possible to gain some space here by moving this Sina diode, the one for the switching transistor, all the way to the right, because currently it's not using the full length of the slot. I think we gained at least one millimeter of space by shifting the diode. Either the flux or the alcohol are used or the heat from soldering seemed to have removed a little bit of the black paint on this diode, unfortunately. But I don't think there's any functional problem with that. I have a piece of copper plated board here and what I will try to do is to remove a tiny strip of copper every 1.5 millimeters in order to build a little circuit board for the diode chain. This was an absurdly difficult soldering job and it 
turns out to be quite crazy to do this without a custom PCB, but surprisingly all the connections are correct now. The diode chain is installed. The resistor to ground here is still missing because I'm still waiting for a delivery of SMD components because the metal film axial resistors that I have are somewhat too large to put here. So let's put the board aside for the moment. The next task is to install the new CDS cells in the sensor assembly. These are the original ones, but let's first unmount and clean this circuit board. We see that the contact going to the hot shoe is a separate metal part. I think officially you are not supposed to bend the legs of these CDS cells, but it's simply not possible to install them in the camera without bending the legs. So we will try to prepare them in the same shape that the original CDS cells had. Currently the CDS cells are quite loose in there, they are only held by their leads. So I will put a drop of hot glue on to secure them mechanically. The hot glue idea didn't work out at all, so I built this little jig to hold the CDS sensors into the sensor assembly and I will apply small drops of glue and let the glue settle to hopefully hold the sensors securely in the assembly. The gluing jig worked well and now each of the sensors is held in by two tiny drops of glue. This is similar to how the sensors were mounted originally and it should be no problem to break this small amount of glue when the sensors need to be replaced. I wish I would have installed both sensors in the same orientation 
I don't think it will make any significant difference, but it would have been neater, so that's maybe something you want to take into account. Let's check the resistance of the new resistors I got. They are all pretty close, but let's use the third one, which was measuring nicely. I think it will be a nice fit here between the contact pads. The CDS assembly is now ready to be reinstalled in the camera. We also need to put back the viewfinder lens, concave side outward. And I noticed some remnants of drops of blue on one side of the viewfinder lens. So I think this is the side that originally was butted up against the top of the plastic frame here. Just reviewed my earlier videos and these three wires used to be routed under the wires crossing the prism here so we will put them back Now the white wire for the hot shoe contact. I check the soldering under the magnifier and the joints look as good as they are going to get without covering the whole camera in a ton of flux. So let's now check them electrically. Pin 7 should be connected to the upper trays on the CDS assembly. That's fine. Pin 9 should connect to the lower trays. Good. And for the hot shoe contact we can check continuity to the X sync contact that is the lower one here on the front. I check connectivity to the middle conductor of the socket. Perfect. The next task is to reinstall the prism cover and originally it covered everything except this yellow loop of wire and these green and black wires. These springs are quite annoying, but I think I finally got them back where they were attached originally. And I also got the cables routed like they used to be, with the green and black below the spring and the yellow one 
above the spring. As I want to measure the results with our new lock compression, we need to close the top of the camera to avoid any stray light. I'm using a tiny amount of grease to keep this plunger from dropping out from the shutter release button. When you close the top of the camera, take care not to jam the black cloth that forms a light seal here around the viewfinder. It is very easy to get this in the wrong place and that's why it usually is already bent, which makes it even harder to get it to comply. To finish the PCB, we still must install the series resistor for lock compression here. And I've got these 68 ohm SMD resistors. Spot on. That went very well, I think, and with that our circuit board is finished. You may remember that when we tested CDS cells, the resistances came out rather high, usually at the upper end of the spec range or even above. A viewer of these videos raised an interesting question. Could it be due to the color temperature of the LEDs I'm using as a light source for these measurements that the resistances come out so high? He observed that the CDS datasheets specify very low color temperatures around 2800 Kelvin as test conditions. It's an interesting question. Unfortunately, I do not have any professional metrology tools for measuring color temperatures or spectra, but what I do have is some high quality color filters. So I came up with an idea. I built this wonderful contraption that has my Gosson 6 tomat flash exposure meter and very close to its sensor it also has our reference diode and two of the most interesting CDS elements, the GL5510F and the NSL5110. The front of this contraption can accept one of my filter holders and even though I cannot easily change the color temperature of my light source, I can now very easily put a filter in front of all these sensors and effectively use a very different light source for measurements. So what do you think might the results be? First the results for the diodes. Here is the photo current of the reference diode as a function of the exposure value indicated by the 6 tomat. 
independent of the filter used, the response of the diode is exactly linear within our error of measurement. The results for the different color filters all fall on the same line, which indicates that the spectral sensitivity of the reference diode is very similar to the one of the 6 tomat which is not too surprising since of course the Gossen 6 tomat also uses a silicon diode as its sensor element. So far no surprises and it means that we can use the SLD 70BG2 diode as a reference diode without any issues. Let's see the effect that the filters have on the illuminance indicated by the reference diode. This plot shows the response of the diode to the filters at various levels of brightness over about a 10 stop range. The short lines on the left indicate the response of a theoretical sensor with uniform spectral response. Comparing the diode to that, we see that the diode has a highly elevated response to green light and a lower response to orange and yellow light compared to the uniform sensor. The response to the blue light is about the same as for the uniform sensor. Overall this is consistent with the diode having its peak sensitivity in the green wavelengths. The response to the filters is nicely uniform over the full brightness range, indicating that the spectrum of the LED light source does not change significantly over this 10 stop range of brightness. Results for the CDS elements look quite different. Here are the CDS resistances drawn as a function of the photocurrent in the reference diode. The separation between the curves for different filters indicates that the CDS elements react to the different filter colors quite differently than the reference diode. Compared to the unfiltered light, we see much higher resistances for the green and blue light and somewhat lower resistances for yellow and orange light indicating that the responsivity of the CDS element is shifted towards the longer wavelength compared to the photodiode. Here are the results compared to the values specified in the CDS data sheets. The GL5510F was somewhat beyond the upper edge of the specified range for the unfiltered light. And we see that for the orange and yellow light, the resistance values fall right within the specified range. For the advanced photonics sensor, the situation is a bit less clear, while the response of the element to the different filters is very similar to the GL5510F. It does not match the values in the datasheet that well, especially in the high light values. The data sheets only give a typical resistance there, but this corroborates my point that the advanced photonics data sheets do not give a good idea of how the elements actually perform. Here's the response of the CDS elements to the filters relative to unfiltered light. The thick lines in the center here give the response of the photodiode as a reference. The CDS elements report much lower light levels for the blue filter and still significantly lower light levels for the green filter than the photodiode. Opposed to that, the response to orange and yellow filter is significantly higher for the CDS elements than for the photodiode. Again, indicating that the sensitivity of the CDS cells is shifted towards the longer wavelength compared to the photodiode. The actual spectral sensitivity of the CDS cells is a bit of a mystery. Here plotted the spectral sensitivity curves are found in various data sheets on top of each other compared to the sensitivity of a modern chromogenic black and white film. While none of the sensors has the same sensitivity as the film, you can see that the photodiode is quite nicely centered within the sensitivity range of the film while all the CDS elements are shifted somewhat towards the longer wavelength. However, the GL5510F, for example, according to its datasheet, still has its sensitivity P 
peaking around 550 nanometers or even slightly below. This is difficult to reconcile with the results we got that show significantly lower responsivity to green light for the CDS cells. Trying to better understand our results, I did a number of numerical simulations using the LED spectrum I found in a paper that analyzed a 5000 Kelvin LED light source. With only quite small tweaks to the LED spectrum from the paper, I get results that are in reasonable agreement with the measured ones for the photodiode. However, for the CDS elements, the measured results differ quite significantly from the simulated results that were created by taking the spectral responsivity curves from the CDS datasheets. Compared to the simulations derived from the datasheet, the CDS cells measured much lower in the blue light and also in the green light. The response to orange light is stronger than simulated. I tried hard to reproduce the measured results doing lots of different changes to the simulated LED spectrum and the spectral response of the sensors. And the only way I could find to reproduce the measured results with some accuracy was to assume that the spectral response of the CDS elements is not centered at 550 nanometers as the datasheets claim, but at a somewhat longer wavelength shifted towards the yellow. The pink dotted line shows the responsivity curve that gave the best results, and you can see it's centered at about 600 nanometers as opposed to the claimed datasheet responsivity. I don't have the means to confirm this difference conclusively, so I will have to leave this point somewhat open. I can just say that everything I saw points to a different spectral response than the one claimed in the datasheets. Maybe you have more data or you have some ideas how to explain this difference in another way. If so, please share them in the comments. What does all of this mean for the calibration of our camera? I simulated the exposure error introduced by using the camera under a light source with a different spectrum than the one it was calibrated for. For example, if the GL5510F behaves as specified in its datasheet and we calibrate the camera using our LEDs, then it will work very well in daylight, but in very warm light we can expect exposure errors of an underexposure up to about half a stop. This is not the fault of our LED light source. We could use perfect black body light sources of various color temperatures and always there would be some exposure errors under light of different color temperature. Actually the span of errors is always the same. We can just shift the error from one point to the other by choosing the calibration light source. Actually, the simulated LEDs do quite well as a calibration light source and they perform very similarly to a perfect 5000 Kelvin black body source. Our results indicate that the GL5510F actually behaves somewhat differently. And here are the results for the test sensitivity that I came up with that it shifted towards 600 nanometers. And with this, we must expect larger exposure errors if we use the camera under different light sources. The fundamental problem here is just that the sensitivity of the CDS cell is not centered in the sensitivity range of the film. And this problem cannot be solved by choosing a different light source for calibration. We could start to play some games like having the camera overcompensate for low light levels, assuming that low light usually is also more orange if it is interior lighting, but I really don't want to go there because then the camera, for example, wouldn't work in shade with a very blue and low light. Instead, I will just keep in mind that if I use the camera in low temperature tungsten lighting, that I have to derate my film sensitivity by about one stop to get correct exposures. 
Hello, we are back in the darkroom and ready to test our new log compression installed in the camera. I have the camera on the light controller stand and it's connected to its PCB here. So the circuit is complete. It has a fresh silver battery inside and I'm measuring a pin 9 voltage with my multimeter. And you can see that as soon as I depress the shutter lightly, we see some voltage appear at pin 9, currently 3.24 volts. And I will now step through the full range of this light controller and record the pin 9 voltage at each stop. Here are the measured P9 voltages plotted as red dots compared to the values predicted by our simulation. The first thing to notice is that the measured voltages are somewhat below the predicted ones and that just means that the light reaching the sensors in the camera is actually a little less than predicted. The overall offset voltage is arbitrary anyway, so let's compensate for that. Once we remove the offset, we see that the match to the desired slope of the pin 9 voltage is very, very good. My final simulations were aiming for a slope of 141.5 millivolts per stop, because that's the value that gives the best results with what we measured from the discharge network. The new log compression matches this desired slope very precisely. The only bad news is that in the lower light values, our results are slightly worse than predicted. In these lower values, we do get residual errors somewhat above a third of a stop. So far, I don't know what causes the deviation from the predicted behavior in these values, but overall the results are very good and the log compression definitely works well enough that the camera should work decently. Our work on the circuits of the camera is now completed and all that remains is that we need to calibrate the camera. But we will do that in the next video. So see you then. This video is dedicated to my father who is a lifelong Pentax enthusiast. He owns the cameras and he has also provided for the quite significant costs of this project. So thank you dad.